years. There we go. Those are entities that have been developed in their either 40s, to kind of quasi independent entities. Some of them are private not for That they land, you know, so, and it came out of Flint, Michigan, and they keep the houses. And that generally has been tax you know, What I don't know is what my banks are doing with when they get properties of the banks and the bank and the we were next to each other. Right. right. And I know some enabling legislation of some states gives land banks authority to do their own research. And I think land banks are the vehicle for that. Right. So the thing, there's a thing, uh, the Center for Community Process. We're going to get started. And it's a really good organization. So I should have brought it in with my real interest. Okay, welcome again to the Economic Democracy Conference for the Democracy Convention. And I just want to remind you that, again, that tonight at 6 p.m. in the same plenary room at the Inn on the Park, where we had the plenary last night, we're doing a big roundtable um, discussion of the big picture of the economy and how to recreate it for people on the planet. So I hope you can make it to that. And that will be followed by a social event at the Osaka House at 505 State Street, where we can continue that conversation. You can meet with a lot of the presenters. So I'm excited um, now to introduce Nancy Korber, and this um, topic of this next talk is going to be Sustainable Solutions for Local Economies. Nancy is a uh, founder and executive director and principal broker of Project Reconomy, up here, projectreconomy.org. And um, it's an Oregon nonprofit. She has 35 years of experience in real estate and is a professional public speaker, trainer, consultant, and published writer. She has trained extensively at conventions and customized in-house programs on sales, marketing, barter, strategic planning, telephone skills, customer service, market trends, economics, planning, and the market. I think what's really exciting is the work that she's been doing in Oregon to keep people in their homes and build up the economy locally. Okay, thank you. All right, first thing I'm going to do is is ask if those of you in the back, since we have a small group, could move up to the front two rows, who'd be willing to become that uncomfortable? You can say no, but we're going to talk about resistance today. <laughs> we're going to talk about why your movements aren't moving. You're stuck in that row, right? <laughs> so I really, really, it makes it easier for me if you're willing to move up front and become a little bit uncomfortable. Because that's what you need to be asking your followers. And I want to thank Margaret and Kevin for their unending commitment to these causes and to the work they do. It's just unbelievable. If any of you have ever tried to put on an event and, um, oh, we were just inviting people up. Okay. There's nobody in the back row in this workshop. <laughs> that was because I came in late and nobody asked me to come forward. <laughs> it's been rude, but that's not the case now. So please join us up here. Um, so I'm going to do a quick ask on who's in the room. And well, here's what I want. I want your name. You don't have to give me your last name. This is a 12-step program. First names are good. Okay, so I want your first name, the state you're from, and what just in a couple of words, what work you're working on in your communities. <clears throat> Gail Williamson, uh, Santa Cruz, California, I'm a public access television. I also, personally, I'm being more closed over the last several years. I'm about to come to this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mary Beth, I'm from Iowa, about to move to Florida, and I'm a public woman. Okay, good. Um, my name is Maureen Cruz, I'm from Los Angeles. I work on many things, but primarily single care members of Okay, good. My name is Michael. I'm from Wisconsin. I live in Madison now. Um, I'm a co-op advocate. Until recently, I worked at the university here at the Center for Cooperatives. Now I'm part of a volunteer group called Gain Cooperative Alliance, which is trying to build a cross-sector group of cooperatives to build a local co-op economy. Okay, good. I'm Dave. I'm from New Jersey, and I combat predatory mortgage foreclosure. Thank you, Dave. I'm, I'm Dave from Washington, Texas, and uh, with the Coffee Party and 
Who do know? Okay. I'm Ray. I'm from Washington State, and um, I'm a student. I'm interested in the um, uh, economic economy. Okay. Hi, I'm Melinda. I'm from Albuquerque. I'm actually working on some international issues, human rights, Palestinian issues. But I'm also watching, uh, working with Food and Water Watch on uh, GMO and fracking in New Mexico. So what is the core issue? Notice how you all come from different backgrounds, different states. The work that we do at Project Reconomy is about uniting our communities and our people so that we can um, have sustainable communities. But that, every one of these issues, move to a man, fracking. I mean, you know, what, what, what problems does fracking affect? Well, everything. I mean, all of these, all of these corporate predators are interlinked, you know, in terms of water quality and energy use, particularly in a desert like New Mexico. Uh, we can't afford the kind of uh, uh, water, not only quantity issues, but quality issues. But it also, it, it involves, you know, overuse of energy, and it requires a great deal of water uh, even to do frack. Uh, so there's, I mean, there's a lot of energy. Okay, so what is the common, what is, if you could use one or two words, what is the common, Piece that is over the top of the system. People be for profits. Yeah. Okay, people be for profits. Okay, I'm going to put two words up here. I don't know how to spell the first one. By the way, if you can't read my writing, it's because it's not readable. And I do have some handouts. So, how do you spell unbridled? U N B R I D L E D. That is the core issue in every one of the issues at all nine conferences going on. And the core issue in every one of our neighborhoods. And where does unbridled greed live? Where is its headquarters? Wall Street. Okay. 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 Capitalism. It's on Wall Street. And most of it goes through the banks and the hedge fund managers. I don't care if it's the utilities companies, whatever. They all have that tie into the banking system. And what I'm here to do today is to perhaps tie some of these pieces together and talk about our work and how do we unweave it. Is that important? Yes. And it doesn't matter if I'm talking about foreclosure or building barter systems for small micro business owners to, you know, to be more sustainable, teaching by, um, by local campaigns, developing state banks to keep our money local. All those are issues that, we, that we're working on. But it all comes from the same core. And when you look at unbridled greed, I have an ebook that we had out, and I now have it off our website, and I'm reworking it. And I'll read just a couple of words out of it. Um, the ebook was called The Lord of the Purse, and this was a parody on The Lord of the Rings, if any of you have read The Lord of the Rings. And we have four sections. The first section is The Squid Master of Wall Street, the introduction. It's like The Hobbit. We're introducing the players. Uh, any of you read any of Matt Taibbi's work? Yes. yes. Okay, Matt, my, Matt Taibbi has a quote. And we start off in the beginning of The Lord of the Purse on the Squid Masters of Wall Street. It says, the world's most powerful investment bank. We're talking about Goldman Sachs. But really, Goldman is the leader. But I don't care if we're talking about Chase, Bank of America, Citibank. Who are some of the other names? Deutsche. Deutsche. Okay, Deutsche is well, interesting Sparta. because it's in Germany and they play a particular part. It's not so Wall Street. U.S. Bank. U.S. Bank is a biggie. Who else do you Bank of America, Wells Fargo. Okay. Now here's the biggies. You guys know the Citibank. biggest names, all right? How many of you have money in those institutions? Can you shame yourself in front of your peers? Can I, okay. Can I put my head down at the same yes. time? <laughs> yeah. And this is the day. I hope if nothing else, you get your money out of those institutions. Because when you have even a dollar there, you're participating in your own demise. And I'm going to talk about why we keep, I mean, we've got activists here, right? Why would we have money in those banks? Give, give me a reason, since you're willing to shame yourself with your peers So here. We, we had our first mortgage through them, and they gave us this great deal on um, investing. So we actually pay nothing to, to buy and sell. Oh. So that's the only thing we have left. In that. The high price of buying cheap. I'm gonna, we're going to talk so, about that. So we, we really kind of feel like we might be like, you know, 
pulling money away from them because we actually don't pay anything for this service. We just use it. Okay, we're going to talk about grief today. Our organization's first name was Good Grief America. But I had a couple of board members that were flipping out about that name, and so we changed it to Project Reconomy after this huge process, democratic process. And those folks have now gone off the board, and everybody else wants to go back to the old name, but we're staying with Project Reconomy. We're going to talk about grief. And we're going to talk about the five stages of going through grief and the rationale that we do to stay with the man who beats us. All right? And I just want to thank you for being brave enough to say it. Tiny comment. Uh, people on Social Security Disability, uh, is it true that the federal government only sends wires of money directly to these banks? In fact, by the way, the bank holding corporations, you know, uh, Robert Rubin and all that, they create bank holding companies and they're offshore and they pay no taxes whatsoever. I don't know if you know that, Bank of America or all that. They actually pay no taxes to America at all. They're offshore. But is it true that the federal government sends to senior citizens only to Wells Fargo Bank? You know, you know I don't know I don't know that answer. It, I've heard that. That's only true. It may very well be true. Which is means that okay. senior citizens are locked into that tragedy. It is true. They oh, it is true. true. Okay, so if it gets wired to the Social Security you're talking about? I get mine goes to Wells Fargo. If I move to a State bank. Or My husband gets Social Security. It goes to our local bank we bank with. Really? It goes to my credit union. It goes to wherever you ask them. See, Wells Fargo is lying to me. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll surprise. All right. <laughs> In the ebook, throughout the ebook, that's novel. <laughs> we have the words written. Need to change that. Take it to credit union. No. What, what we have written repeatedly is if their lips are moving, it's probably a lie. <laughs> so, okay. So here's what, what uh, Matt Tybee said. He says, the world's most powerful investment bank is a giant vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity, relentlessly jamming its blood funnel into anything that smells like money. Great. It's a phenomenal quote. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, this unbridled greed, what is greed? Greed is, and I looked the word greed up, Greed is good. Greed is good. <laughs> it has moments. Uh, I, I went, looked at Wikipedia. You know, now that we're online, Wikipedia is a great source of it. It says, greed is an excessive desire to possess wealth or goods with the intention to keep it for yourself. Then it goes on to say, greed is inappropriate expectations. However, greed is applied to a very excessive, oh, I can't even read this, rapturous desire and pursuit of wealth, status, and power. So when we look at what drives Wall Street, is unbridled greed. Now, we can take that on and lose all day long. Or we can figure out how to quit participating with it. And that's, I'm, I'm going to talk about that, and I'm going to drive things home. We're going to talk about what we have done. I can tell you, oh, we did this. I've got a list here. In fact, let me pass some of these back. Handouts and pass them around. Um, this is why I want you closer. Send some back this way. I mean, this talks about the work we've done. But the work we've done isn't as important as the mindset and the frame we walk into this work. We got told everything we set ourselves out to do, that it was impossible, we were wasting our time, we were crazy. How many of you have been told this? There's no way. <laughs> now, the good thing is, I couldn't hear that. <laughs> And uh, we not only achieved everything we set out to do so far, but we have even bigger goals sitting in front of us, and we expect to achieve them as well. But we're not going to deal, we're not going to achieve them by taking the bull on by the horns. And I mean that. How many of you have been to Wall Street? Any of you went to Occupy? My husband and a few of our attorneys in our attorney <coughs> network went and they stood next to the big bull and got their picture taken. And I, and I, I love to tell stories because you may not remember the facts. But if I can get you to take on the stories, when you're in the trenches of the war zone, if you can pull up the story, you can get through the battle. Are you all with me? OK. Um, and it's a story about how a bullfighter, any of you ever watch a bullfight, even on TV? It's kind of unpleasant. I have no desire to watch a bullfight. But they're part of you know, the, some of the culture here on, on this planet. What happens in a bullfight? I want you to imagine this huge arena where the arena is full of people, and out comes the matador. What happens? 
The crowd cheers, right? Okay? Metagers all adorned. He's looking gorgeous. He's got his little tools. And then, across the arena, up comes a gate. And out comes a thousand pounds of bull. That's Wall Street. The crowd goes wild. They cheer ten times heavier for the bull than they did the matador. That's what we've got going on in America. They may say they don't want to like the bull, but they cheer for the bull and they stand behind the bull. And we keep our money in there. And what happens when we start telling the truth about what's going on? If we're the messenger with the truth, quite often they'll annihilate the message. What happens if the matador takes the bull on by the horns? Right off the bat, we get the trust. He dies immediately. So a smart matador knows he dances with the bull. And what he does is he hangs that little red thing out there, that little flag. And the bull comes at him and he steps aside. And then he hangs it out here. And he steps aside and he throws little tiny spears in the back of his back until the bull finally is vulnerable and tired. And he gets up and he puts the sword in the vicious what do too many people as activists go out and do? Confront head on. They take it head on, or if the bull doesn't lay down for the spear early on, they quit. How often of you, if you've been on a team, an organization, you've got volunteers, and they're quitting before the fight is over? Okay. So we're going to talk about some of those dynamics and how we wove those into our work, because that's the core of this whole issue, and I don't care what cause you're for, they're all, the bull is the same. It's unbridled greed on Wall Street. And I've got to the point where I don't even make unbridled greed the bad guy. I'm not even at war with Wall Street. I'm dancing with Wall Street. They, I no longer participate with them, with my money, in any way I don't have to. And I'm unhooking in every way, manner, or form. And I'm training thousands and thousands of families all over Oregon. And it's spreading out across the country. How to quit participating and feeding the bull. And how do you let the bull wear down until you can just put the spear in? And so that's what our work is really about. And that's why we're winning on the tasks we're doing. Because we don't expect instant gratification. What is our culture? Our young people want what? Instant gratification. Instant gratification. And I don't know where that came from. But it doesn't work in human nature. Um, so I want to thank each one of you for coming and being part of the solution. You're here because you care. You didn't give up how many days of your life and travel across the country because this was fun. I did. You did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, a lot of these topics we're dealing with are what we kind of call root canal topics. They're tough topics <laughs> to wrap your head around. So good for you, Maureen. I'm a dentist. I mean, you know, no, oh, I'm not. not. <laughs> <laughs> I love root canals. Okay. Um, I'm not. <laughs> so addiction. Addiction is the core issue that runs unbridled greed. And uh, I've got a whole section on addiction in the book. And hopefully I'm going to have it up. If any of you want this, yes. hopefully it's going to be back on the website in the next couple of weeks. Um, what is addiction? How do we deal with addiction? If we're just dealing with this as a war zone, we lose. If we deal with it as an addictive situation, we have the opportunity to start winning. We need some more. Would you pass this back? Um, Anybody here a 12 stepper? Okay, we got one 12 stepper. I'm a retired geneticist, PhD in cancer surgery. There is such a thing called compassion gene or gene complex. And most of these people on Wall Street, they lack this gene. But they're addicted. They're addicted to their heroin money, just like some people collect cards or stamps or something, they're addicted to collecting money. That's where they get their addiction, but they lack compassion to Exactly. And every addict has got some genetic makeup that makes it. Did you ever notice that some people can drink alcohol and they're fine and some people cannot? 
I was born into a household of a father who was an addict. So was my dad. He was an alcoholic, he was a workaholic, he was a gambleaholic, he was a sexaholic. My dad was a dad. Is your dad my dad? Which <laughs> one? We are the lucky wounded. And he married a woman who nobody understood what was going on with her. That was my mother. But she was a brilliant woman with high functioning Asperger's. She was very educated. She had several master's degrees. She was a school teacher and she could not do ordinary things. Giving birth was a default act that happened, so three of us arrived. But as far as caring for us, it did not exist. So we have, this is the dynamics I grew up in. And I had to spend years later in my adulthood going through recovery of living through that family of origin. And the reason I'm telling you this is because the issues we're dealing with, the solutions are not that much different than recovering from addictions or being a codependent. I became a raving codependent. Anybody here think that they're a codependent? You very well maybe could be because you're doing this work. Um, but growing up in my household, and I'm going to talk about the addict and how this work fits into it. So, so bear with me. My father was very much like the Wall Street player. In fact, my father was very successful financially. And my mother was always in poverty even though she was brilliant and a school teacher. And they ended up divorcing. But as a child growing up, when my father came home, if I even had the wrong look on my face or said the wrong words, I would find his fist in my face and find myself across the wall. What happens when we as activists speak out against the addict on Wall Street? Didn't we just have a bunch of people arrested right over here for singing? Yeah. Do you know that my home of origin, I could have gotten a whipping for singing. So what has happened to America when we live under this addictive culture that rules us? How do we start reacting? How do we handle things? How do we solve problems? What happens is to survive in it, we become codependents. And we rationalize behavior that continues the beings. So I'll pick on Michael. You know, we rationalize why it's okay to stay with the man who beats us. And what was my mother? Who should, who should a mother be? Shouldn't that be the person who cares for you in the home, keeps you safe, nurtures you? My mother wasn't capable. But what she did to keep me alive was that she would drug me. Huh. And I was a complete drug addict as a child until age of eight. Phenobar, par Paragor, other very, very heavy drugs that affected my health that I deal with today. So, but that kept me alive because if I didn't open my mouth, I didn't get smacked. How does that correlate to the work that we're doing here today? How many millions out there know what's going on is wrong, but they won't open their mouth? Well, I think lots more know, what's, they know something's wrong, but they don't know what. They don't know what, and what happens if they find out? They won't get They're paralyzed. They're paralyzed. And I was diagnosed until the age of five of being retarded. I was very nonverbal. Why was I nonverbal and acting retarded? I was heavily drugged. So when you look at America today, when you look at how many of you work on, anybody of you work on teams and you get frustrated because people are just acting kind of retarded? A lot of people. But the whole country's on the drug of Okay, that's a drug. That's a huge drug, and it's the one that they talk a little or they may lie. They're on. We're on it. Okay, I've I'm got the now. propaganda of the, the television. We also have what happens when women speak out and they go to the doctors? What does the doctor give them? Antidepressant. Well, it used to be Valium, but what is it today? Antidepressant. Antidepressants. It's Prozac. Antidepressants, anti anxiety. It's called drug the bitch. Shut her up. I mean, we are so drugged on so many different things. So I'm gonna, and one of the things I had to realize when we started into this work was to have compassion for those that came my way that I had to work with. Because I realized I could not, this work could not be done by Nancy and Mark, me and my husband. We were the founders. This work had to be done by the efforts of qualified others. 
And I'll tell you, sometimes the most ragtag individuals came in front of me, and we, we've served a couple of thousand families directly now in our state. And if you would look at those families and go, oh my God, how did you get anything done with that group of people? Well, that's what I had to work with. And let me tell you, most of them came to me in PTSD, totally immobilized, their lives weren't working, yet they were smart, they weren't retarded, their actions looked retarded. They looked like the sleeping dead. That's what's going on in America. So when we start looking at what's the real problem, it is the addict versus the sleeping dead, the codependent. And you know, I expected my mother to protect me. She did the best she could. And you know what? When Daddy decided to climb in bed with us girls at night and rape us, it was a lot easier to do if we were not. And I'm telling you these really graphic stories because I want you to realize, number one, that is what's going on in America. And when we can start to understand that, we can start to make change. Go ahead. You've read Motherless Daughters. No, but I've read a lot of books. You should. But I've spent years in recovery, and it no longer defines who I am. See, I can talk about what happened to me without falling apart into a pool of snot and tears. Because I've worked on recovery. America needs to work on a recovery. And it happens one person at a time. Wall Street has no power when they don't have codependence. So where does power come from? Who has the power? I remember sitting in front of some union leaders a few years back, hearing the lecture on who has the power? Who's got the power? When you, we're sitting there crying out of codependence, do we have power? Well, you have it, but are you exercising it? No. No. So how do you take back your power? And that's one of the things we did in our work. And I'll tell you, my members don't even know most of the time what I'm doing to them because when they come in the shoot, they are so in pain. They can't hear any of this. And I have to take them from where they are, give them one assignment at a time, and allow them to process through. And some of them go away because it's so painful and they can't face reality. The media has a term called MIGO. Any of you heard that term? It's an acronym for my eyes glaze over. How much tolerance does the American public have for reality? Not much. Because if we face reality and we talk about it openly and we look for solutions, that fist might come out and pop us right in the face. My father had, had, uh, used to train hunting dogs and he had this razor strap that he slid into strips to, to whip the dogs when they weren't right. And he decided one day that was too cruel for the dogs. That became his tool of management for me. And I would have welts all over my body for nothing. Sometimes he'd say, that's to remind you not to open your mouth before you do. How is that happening in our culture? What happens when we speak the truth? You get punished a lot. You lose your job, you lose your friends, you lose your community of support. You go to jail. Go to jail? Okay, what about Bradley Manning? Yes. Did that man tell the truth? Yes. Yeah. Is he a bad guy? No. Look what he has gone through. It's a show trial. Because the addict does not want the truth out. And you know, we can look at why isn't the Obama administration doing something for him? Any of you ever asked that? Because of all the measures. Yes, you go ahead. Yeah, they're doing it to him, but why? Why? They don't want the truth out. They don't want the truth out, but who? It's when you look at our politicians, they're like our mothers. Aren't they the people we elected to protect yeah. us? They're dysfunctional people. They're psychopaths. They have no feeling for others. There is no other. Just and some of them <laughs> might be really, let me go, one, two, but let me get here first. Some of them might be really, really good people that went to Washington to do good work, and when they got there, Somebody got the whip out and let them know how the rules run. And you won't get reelected if you buck <clears throat> this. And what runs our wars, our whole war machine? Uh, corporations. It's this. It's the Halliburtons. 
And who was a major employer of Halliburton? Cheney. 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 I mean, you look at the real issue is this. And our politicians, there's good ones there, are running scared. And here's what they do. They, they, they look at you, and if you get too threatening, it's like, let's get Marlene, so Mar Maureen. Oh, Maureen. Yeah. Let's get Maureen some Prozac. <laughs> okay? And that's what they do. Our, or that you can be sent to jail, or you can be made a spectacle of and set an example. And that is why we don't have change. These issues we deal with are so easy to fix. The problem is our codependence. Yes. So, I, you know, I'm setting up my talk with that. We're going to talk about our work we do, but I think it's so important to understand who the enemy was. I sat in a workshop in here, so the delightful couple who talked about um, so socialism and um, communism and um, what's for the future. The future, but you know, what was the big word that was? They didn't want to use socialism. No. What was the? Uh, it starts with a C. Help me. Communalism or communalism. capitalism? Capitalism. That one. Now, I have been looking at capitalism all of my life because I trained business people for decades. Capitalism is it the problem? Crony capitalism is a serious problem. That's what we have right now. Fascism, which is the next step, is a serious problem. I'm still trying to decide if capitalism is really bad or not. I haven't made that decision. It's not bad for buying shoes. It's bad for anything you need. It's bad if you want a system that will ultimately sustainably protect people on the planet because capitalism will always revert back to what we have right now. It, because you end up getting the ones with the genetics that rise to the top. <laughs> <laughs> that that no, it's because it's inherently built on scarcity it's and debt. Pardon? It's, 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 it's built on scarcity. It requires unsust you know, unsustainable growth. Those are all okay. inherent to capitalism. I take it that buying shoes is bad because they won't pay the workers. So let's, <laughs> is there anything that can happen? We can't have a Main Street. And I can tell you, the majority of the people I trained were small and micro-business owners. And many of them ran really legitimate businesses, creating win-wins in their community, and cared about their employees. When you start getting bigger than that, it starts getting scary. But in rural America, the backbone of the economy is those micro-business owners that have been slaughtered in this collapse. So I don't know what the answer is. And I'm not here to say capitalism is good, bad, or otherwise. Hold on a second. But that. There's all these pieces that can play in. How do we tame the beast? Right here. Now, if I was going to try and take my daddy on, I would lose every time. What I finally did do is, at the age of 13, leave home and be a homeless kid living on the streets because that was safer than living in my home of origin. How do we start unhooking? How do we start building and then building something we can live in? That's, you know, those are good questions, and what I'm really excited is that this conference is full of workshops with a lot of those ideas that we get to take back to our community. But the process of unhooking is this process of the grief process, and most people won't go through the steps. The first one is denial. What does denial look like in the work you do? It's not that bad. It's not that bad. The only be The lesser evil. evil. It's a lesson of evil. We live in the greatest country, so this has to be the best way. Go ahead. I love the one I first when I came to this country, you know, and I looked at, you know, I came for that American dream, and I looked at everybody and I said, these people are asleep. And then. I was going to dream. Yeah. But then they, they said to me, um, at least we have freedom here. This is what they told me. How much freedom do we have if we're debt slaves? Yeah. How much freedom do we have? Okay, comment back here. Yeah. Uh, I went to St. Hill College. My chemistry professor, Dr. Corbin Agri, discovered Mylar film for 3M Corporation. Made hundreds of millions of dollars for 3M. He was a multi, multi millionaire. He kept his money in a local tiny savings bank because he told me and others. I don't trust the big banks in New York. He was smart because he was the son of a farmer who lost a farm in Minnesota. So they knew what the big banks can do to the little guy. But the last thing that's very important is that, you know, 
when I was in Russia in 1991. Khrushchev just had gotten in power, or well, Gorbachev, Gorbachev was just getting into power, and the Russians, I speak some Russian, and I speak Finnish, and you know, English, of course, that in German also. And they told me, why don't the Americans come and help us become free? These were the average Russians. These were the average Russians. You understand that? And my grandfather was one of the two that started the humane work, like I told you that before, here in America. But who stopped that process of the Americans helping the average Russian? Cheney. Cheney, the war machine. If you have peace, you don't make money on the only peace. You make money on war. Okay. So, you make money on all kinds of things that hurt us. It's called the man who beats you. And how do you quit participating with the man who beats you? So, denial. How does denial look? Well, it's okay to keep my money in Bank of America because I get this free trading thing and I'm rationalizing it. This is, this is denial. What is the stage out of denial? Anger. Anger. I've got them up there. Anger. In our culture, is it okay to express anger? No. No. So we get shut down very quick. Only a ball game. Only a ball game. Okay. So there's, there's places where the rules fit. Interesting. When I have families who call me that are they're underwater in their house, and they are drowning, and they have borrowed from every, they, they, every line of credit they have, they've racked up to keep that house going. Then they borrowed from every family member. Now, they've taken their debt from one unsustainable position and multiplied it to many. That was said, I said, why did you do that? I asked them, why did you do that? And I got to tell you, we did a little bit of it, but I stopped early. We had an uh, uh, IRA that we were borrowing on for our house. And one day I woke up and I said to my husband, this is bad. These banks won't be there for us in our retirement years. We've got to quit draining this. And we stopped. They tell me, why do you think people tell me I have to keep paying this unsustainable debt? Right. Well, maybe you know the statistic. People always think it's going to get better. Uh, I forget exactly the number, but a huge amount of Americans think that in 10 years they'll be millionaires. Okay. Okay, that goes right back into what? Denial. Denial. And they think it's going to make them happy. One of the things with the addiction gene that um, these Wall Street bankers have. If they, if they make a million bucks, are they happy? No. Yeah. If they, they double it. They get a little high for, 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 for a few high. seconds. If they make two million bucks, are they twice as happy? No. So this whole American dream, I've got to get rich or I can't be happy. What's wrong with it? It fits into denial. And when, when we realize that the American dream, the bowl of candy we were handed, was a bowl of poison. And we start coming out of denial. The rage is unbelievable. And when families call me, they're in PTSD over it. They're absolutely, you, you can't even have an adult conversation with them that makes sense about their finances. And so we've got all this anger we have to deal with. So I have to give them assignments to go do something, because I have to get them into action. Um, this, the next step is bargaining. What does bargaining look like? Well, if I can just borrow another 50000 then it's all going to be okay. I'm just going to get another 50000 from the man who beats me to pay the last 50000 I couldn't pay off. Okay. This is what's going on in America. And it ties into finances and Wall Street to everything we do. The next step is I see with, with people is sadness. They're crying. And this came from Dr. Kugler Ross's work with Grief and Dying, if any of you haven't read it. Um, she was from Switzerland, she dealt with, and it's a dignity issue to me. I see our work as a dignity issue. When families call me, I'm more concerned about their dignity than I am their houses. And if we can restore dignity, and if I can get them through the grief process, and then they decide they want to keep their house, most of them do. But if I can't get the dignity back, we get nowhere. Nothing happens. So, sadness, this is where they're crying. I mean, I get... I get 40 year old men sobbing hysterically. Mm -hmm. I get men who call me three, four months later after we started the process and say, I was on the verge of suicide when I called you. Now that's really scary. And you know, that's the fastest rate of suicide is men in their 50s now. Fastest growing rate. Well, because they fight. What did our culture tell us? I mean, one of the things I cover in people is I talk about. 
who are we? This collapse is the perfect storm for us to reinvent who we are. But this is a blessing. Reinvent how we want to live, how we want to be. Who are we? Are we human ownings? Are we our McMansion we're losing? Are we human doings? Are we that job we lost? That job we didn't even like? That was a man who beat us. <laughs> no, we're human beings. And so I work with our members. We're not human ownings. We're not human doings. We're not human beings. We're not defined by what we own. And so when they can get past that, all of a sudden, power starts coming in. And how do you move people from where they are to where they want to be? You do it when they take their own power back. You finally get to acceptance. And here's where I know I've got someone I can work with, is when they say to me, I'm willing to put my house on the table. It can go, it can stay, I'm fine either way. That's when we start to have power. When I have people who call me up and say, I'm going to die if I lose this house. Where are they at? They're way up there in, somewhere in insanity between denial and anger. I have to have this house. I mean, you ought to hear this reasons. I say, oh, really? Why do you have to have this house? Because if they can't let go, we can't save it. Why do you have to have this house? I mean, I, the stories are unbelievable. I have one who says, well, I have two pit bulls. <laughs> <laughs> Pit bulls, tell me about the bulls. Well, I, they were rescue bulls, and nobody else will take them, and the pit bulls will be put down if I lose this house. And I said, you know, I don't have capacity to save pit bulls. That's not part of our mission, but I, you know, I have compassion for you. You're going to have to come, you know, we're going to have to get past that. You're going to have to be willing to put this house on the table if you want to save it. And maybe we can't, maybe we can. And he was so in PTSD about the pit bulls, he couldn't move him from here. And he was, he disappeared. I'm sure he's been evicted. I don't know. It's out there somewhere. The party's over for him. Now, what's worse, being evicted with the pit bulls or finding a sustainable solution for the pit bulls, putting the house on the table, and putting together a really smart plan? You know, maybe he's going to go in the end, but wouldn't it be more powerful if he did it with his own feet instead of being thrown out? Mm -hmm. That's power. And so we don't have evictions. I mean, our members don't have evictions. If they, if they work with us, we either create sustainable exit strategies where they walk out the door feeling like a real victory, or we create sustainable long-term solutions to keep them in the house, and that's a victory. Heidi Donovan, one of my sons is a neurophysiologist, neuropsychiatrist. He's trying to help the young boys that are coming back, and the middle-aged, coming back from the war. Some of them have got real problems. In fact, some of them have an argument like they're really depressed. Mike, uh, and he thinks about this. You have to be very careful. And I'm going to ask this question of you because have you or any in your group ever considered, rather than, say, giving them Prozac or Zoloft or something, okay, I but, 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 but giving lithium carbonate? Okay, I'm going to stop you there. Cost money I, money. Listen, we've got to stop there because we've got to stay on target. Oh, okay. Okay, we can't, we can't go there right but now. But anyways, don't give them prolog because they might, it just ruins them. Go ahead. But she's not a doctor. Yeah. I'm not a doctor. I don't give drugs. Okay. And I don't tell people not to take drugs either. That is something that they've got to make their own decision on. So we're dealing with this process all the time. When you're out on the streets dealing with your issues, we're all in the process somewhere all the time. And the people we're working with are in the process all the time. And one of the things I try to do is get our members educated on this. And when they go back into, when the stress comes up and they get a call from the bank and they're losing, they start going back into denial and anger, I will stop them. And I'll say on the phone, stop. You need to stop. What stage are you at? Where's your power? And bring them back around. And if we don't do that, we get caught in this gerbil wheel from hell. We wonder why our mission isn't moving forward. So when you talk about denial, you're talking not just about denial of the problem, but denial of the possibility. And the whole thing. When denial of the possibility of moving on. That's a denial. Well, that's yeah. what would stop people. And you know, sometimes moving on is a great idea. How many of you have homes you own, you, you live in? When you bought them, did you say they're going to bury me in this house, or this is a house I'm going to have for now? The house or Yeah. And the average statistics over the years is that a homeowner in America stays in a house five years. 
Only 40. So, you know, it's just a temporary. But there's people who stay two years. So, you know, when we look at this, most Americans didn't buy that house forever. They bought it probably for five years. Yeah, when we get into this crisis, this house is not, it's something that it becomes part of who they are. The lack of ownership of it destroys their being. And, and this, this is the case with so many of our issues. Go ahead. Pardon me thinks that that's part of the problem, though, is that the, the real estate market was so buy and sell and just don't think of it as a long-term oh, anything. Yes, I mean, yeah. so people were just like, well, I can move to this city and buy this house, and everything's going to be fine because if I get a job in that city, I can just get up and move. Right. But then all of a sudden, they're like, nope, that's not going to happen because they're already right. willing to buy the house for what you paid. Right, because that's what did they tell us? Real estate always went up. Yeah. And when when I put um, my license back up in about 02 and started realizing what was going on in the market, I was sickened because I saw the market doing this and I knew it wasn't sustainable. So about 05, I started speaking out in the industry. Now, what do they do with the people who speak out? <laughs> well, well, I got blackballed. Basically, you know, you get a you get a fist in your face. And here's what I got told. You have a bad attitude, and you're going to wreck it for everybody, so you better shut up and go away. That's what realtors told me. That's what the Board of Realtors told me. Yes. I was told to shut up, and so I basically did. But by early 07, all of my clientele, I was saying, if it isn't that property you're going to keep for the long haul, you better get rid of it now. And our clientele didn't get hurt, and we started phasing out of the industry. And my husband kept saying, what are we going to do now? And I said, I don't know. But um, I'm not going to make money doing this. And if I'm not going to make money, we better make a difference. And so we started to take our talents and skills and looking at what we could do. And I started looking around our communities and realizing our small micro businesses were collapsing, which was a big part of my background as well. And started talking to them about buy local programs and, and a number of different ideas. Nobody wanted to hear it because the market was booming. And so when the market crashed, we were able to look behind the curtain and see things that we didn't understand. And it was dirtier than I ever imagined. And they still don't want to see it. But when people hit bottom, they call us. And we start working them through the process. And we've just gotten this year where we started training realtors, where I do continuing education classes for realtors on risk management issues that tie into a lot of this. For the last four years, they weren't willing to hear it. We now are finally at a point where they will hear it. So we look for, when the time is right, how can we get in there and start making a difference? We trained, uh, we built a, a network of attorneys, and I personally interviewed over a thousand attorneys to find about 40 that we worked with. That's a lot of work. And you know those attorneys, you know what they said to me when we first started calling back in 09? Why would we want to help a bunch of deadbeats like you? I said, I don't know, because maybe your community is crumbling, and your economy is crumbling, and there's corruption going on here. Maybe you want to make a difference. And if they didn't come through, I would deny them next and make the next call. How many of you would be willing to sit there and take a beating at that level? That's what we had to do. We made a commitment to build that network, and then we made a commitment to educate that network. And the work we're doing in Oregon to stop foreclosures, we have completely shut down the non-judicial process. In about half of the states across America, the non-judicial process is the process they do foreclosure with. It's cheap, it's easy, the dog catcher can take your house without ever documenting and have any proof. We shut it down. And we didn't shut it down by taking the bull on by the horns. We shut it down by small micro pieces, those little spears and spine. And some of the things we didn't do also is that we didn't get in the media, which is so contrary to what movements want to do. We stayed out of the media. Anybody have any idea why we stayed out of the media? We don't want to call attention. Go ahead. Yeah, you, you didn't want to let the, uh, the other side know what was going on. Absolutely. We didn't want to know we were organized. You didn't want that fist. Also, they didn't know. <laughs> That's right. Real life. And I'll tell you, we were vulnerable, and they could have crushed us in the initial stages. And they also mismanaged and misrepresent your message. At, that's the other manipulated. No, but you know why? They're like mama. They didn't want a fist in their face. So they'll tell the story that Big Brother, that 
the attic once told. And so we saw them misrepresenting the stories, and I wouldn't give them our stories. They'd call me up, and then they decided to blackball me. Now, I live in Southern Oregon. When the Medford, Oregon media says, we'll never cover you again because you wouldn't play nice. Do I care? <laughs> I don't care about the Southern Oregon media. I care about our members. I care about the cause. And so one of the things we did was we got outside the box on how we did things. I come from a business background with also years of volunteer and activism work. So I brought those two pieces together. And I looked at it very differently. And I not only was getting pushback, of course, from all kinds of mainstream folks, but the nonprofit organizations were giving us pushback. Well, why aren't you marching in the streets? Anybody want to know why we didn't march in the streets? You're busy. <laughs> we were busy. But let's say any people. OK, here's the question for every action we did was strategically planned. If we march in the streets, and I'm not down on marching in the streets, and we might very well do some marching in the streets when it makes sense. But when you look at what, here's the question I ask, what is the intended outcome of every action? So marching in the streets, what would be the intended outcome? Attention. Visibility. Visibility in media. Did I want it? No. No. Okay. So not only that, when you had a whole community that was frightened and shut down and scared and had been whipped and beaten by the addict, and they were all codependent to this piece, and it was forbidden to talk about it. That was one of the things. When my mother divorced my father finally, she would leave us with caretakers. Who would she choose for caretakers? Abusers. Abusers, of course. That's what she's used to. That's what we were used to. That's she related to those people. And what did the abusers say to us? I remember this one had this, this teenage son that would bless my sister and I. And here's what the, he would say to me. He'd say, if you tell anybody, if anybody finds out, your little brother will die. Now, to a five-year-old, is that frightening? I shut my mouth. We got a whole community in Southern Oregon and all over America that's got the same syndrome going on. And then on my sixth birthday, my little brother died. Do you have any idea what that did to me, thinking it was all my fault? Now, I'm telling you this because I want to hit the core of who you are. I want you to feel it, that that's what's going on with the masses. They're afraid their little brother's going to die if anybody talks about forbidden territory. So here I have a ragtag group of members that are somewhere between here and here in heavily in PTSD and in great grief. Are they going to go march in the streets? No. No. Now, if here I'm in rural Oregon, in a white community. If I was in Detroit and I had a colored community where the people knew they had been oppressed forever, and there was a sense of community that you could join them together, marching in the streets would have worked. And it is working in Detroit on this cause. But if it's going to backfire on me in Southern Oregon, it's better not to do it. So I got a little flack that I wasn't playing the game right for a nonprofit. And here's what I'm going to ask you all to do is be willing to get out of the box in your work. And I'm going to talk about some of the things we've done. We continually got out of the box and did things the way it was going to work. Every question, what is the intended outcome? What is the intended outcome? Margaret called and asked if I'd come speak at this conference. I mean, I'm taking four days out of the office. I get 200 emails a day. And, you know, I'm going to get back and have at least 1,000 emails. And I'm going to be buried. So what was my intended outcome? Not to get buried in the office. <laughs> my intended outcome was to come out and share what we do and make some connections so that we can take, if I can share the work we do that helps anyone to take their work farther and meanwhile glean from the, some of the brightest minds across the country that are coming here that I can take back and make a difference in our community. And we may not do cooperative housing the same way these guys do. We may do it the Oregon way. But what if I pick up four ideas that I can implement? And so what is the intended outcome? Every strategy has got to be strategic. And you're going to take a lot of flack for whatever you do. So when we look at these players, 
when you when you look at them, I look at my daddy as the player that was the Wall Street addict. I look at my mother as the co-addict. And what she did to drug us and just keep us numb. And it was the best she could do. And in therapy and 12-step programs, I had to forgive both of them. Just like I have forgiven Wall Street for being less than they could be. Because if I'm at war with them, they will take me down. What I can do is quit playing with them. I can quit being codependent. And here's the one thing. I, when I grew up and I finally got married, what do you think I married? I hadn't had recovery yet. An abuser. An abuser. But he looked so good. He didn't drink. He was a nice Mormon man. Okay? No drugs, no alcohol, no, you know. Couldn't have sex until you got married. Oh, this is everything I did with him. Hell, I had sex since I was a little kid with a, you know, Love at Home was so wonderful in our house of origin. So I thought this wonderful Mormon man was going to be my salvation. The guy could beat me with religion. And it was a horrible relationship that I survived seven years and left. And I had to forgive him. But what I did was I unhooked and quit playing with that man. I had built in my own business career about a quarter of a million dollars worth of assets by the time I was 29 years old. And that was a lot of money back then. He blew through all of it in a couple of years and told me I wasn't good enough because I didn't know more. This whole game of insanity of dysfunction doesn't work. And I, you know, I spent all kinds of codependent time in, uh, trying to save him, get him to see the light. How many of you have gone to your leaders and tried to save them and get them to see the light? Yeah. You mean mama? You go to mama and she can't hear you. I want you to see her as mama. Go Unsuccessfully. Ahead. Pardon? Unsuccessfully. Unsuccessfully, yeah. Well, and here's what we did. Job because on the <laughs> back in the end of 08, when the market crashed, I realized our business definitely wasn't going to go anywhere. We had some reserves. I had next to no debt except for this house. And I said to my husband, Mark, we're in trouble. We're going to have to call that bank. It was Washington Mutual Land that became Chase. We're going to have to call them and ask them for one of those modifications while we figure out how to regroup here. Does that all make sense? Mm -hmm. Millions of Americans did it because the Wall Street banks got bailed out. They promised to work with us. So we called up, and here's what we said. Hey, we're the good guys. Um, we've got 800 credit scores. We've got equity in our house. We have next to no debt, and our income is down, but we can rebuild. Can you help us for three to five years? They said, no. They said, no. We don't work with people like you. <coughs> That's what they said to me. They don't make money on you. They, they, well, well here's, here's, I'm going to show you exactly what they did. And this ties into every single cause out there. They don't make money off, I mean, they didn't help people like me. And I went, what? They said, you have to be 90 days delinquent. And I thought it was just me. We had so much shame in our house, so much <coughs> grief. My husband was so depressed that he, he couldn't even leave the house. I used to tease him a little bit and say, you look so low, you look like you put a newspaper on the floor and hung your feet over the edge of it. You know, the guy was low. And one day, we decided to get out of this mess. And so we kept calling him, and they said no. So we decided to go with new rules, quit making a house payment, right? I was borrowing to do it. I was borrowing from our IRA. Stupid. But I was in denial, and I was being a good, obedient American. Yes. Yeah. I mean, what? We're good people. We pay our bills. We keep our promises. Does Wall Street keep their promises? No. 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 Okay. So they have a different set of rules. So what we did is we quit paying. The last payment we made on our house was September. No. It was February 1st, 2009. That was four and a half years ago. And we quickly started doing the paperwork. And our paperwork, because we've been self-employed, was 88 pages. And we had a fax machine that didn't have an automatic feeder. Uh, and we'd load it, and we'd send the paperwork in. And anybody guess what they did with it? They couldn't find it. They couldn't find it. They couldn't find it. This went on. Every week, I'd say to Mark, Mark, keep your attitude. It's your part-time job. You know? <laughs> Just keep doing that. We're going to do some men. We're tough. We're strong. I mean, I've lived on the streets. I've survived the worst of it. We can survive this one. We can make them see the light. Where was I? Denial. 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 
And after four months, they threw us in foreclosure and denied us a modification. And the reason they denied us a modification was that we didn't have all our paperwork in. And the paperwork missing was no proof that homeowner association dues were paid. Oh my God. I live on two acres in rural southern Oregon. There are no homeowner association dues. We sent that in so many times, but they denied us for that. We finally, after when we started doing this work, I came up with this analogy that in all those offices, they had this, this big wheel they spin, and we call it the <laughs> wheel of misfortune. <laughs> and whatever the little ticker lands on, that's your reason to get denied. And I've been saying this for four and a half years, and, and there, you know, your dog's toenails were clipped wrong. You know, any reason is good. Too many assets, not enough assets. Too much income, not enough income. Oh, too much forbearance. Now it's been too long. It's all your fault. It reminds me of when, you know, something wasn't right in the household of origin, and Daddy would have to get his whip out and start whipping us because it was all our fault. That's exactly what was going on here. And so when they threw us in foreclosure, I said to myself, self? They've screwed the wrong person now. And we started digging into the paper. We, we had a stack of paperwork about this high they'd sent. It was over in the corner. And we, um, I said to Mark, Mark, you're the reader in the household. You read everything in that stack. He says, I'll read it. He got our closing package out. How many of you read when you bought a house? You read every word. We got one. Did you understand them? No. 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 I, I do now. <laughs> yeah, we found something in there called Mortgage Electronic Registration Systems, and what was that? I said, Mark, how's that on our deed? The first thing I noticed was that our deed had one name, and the note had another. And because I come from 35 years in the real estate industry, I knew there was problems with that. So we started digging in, and when they sent us this foreclosure, I sent them back a little letter that says, excuse me, I'm a little confused. Can you send me a complete trail of how we got from where I took out this loan? And by the way, we had Washington Mutual had been our loan servicer. And I didn't notice, I didn't, I from the industry, I didn't know the difference between a loan servicer and a lender. And they're very different. Okay, so we had them as our loan servicer. I thought they were our lender. And they were shifting over to Chase, but Chase never called us. And Bank of America was foreclosing. What's wrong with this picture? So I asked for a complete trail, and here's what they did. And because I came from the industry, I knew what to ask for. Most lay people don't. I asked for proof of every sale that went from that party to that party, and proof of delivery and proof of receipt. I mean, that's what has to happen to have a true sale, and I knew this. And um, they sent back a letter that said, we're not answering any of those questions because it's proprietary. <laughs> But they didn't tell us, but they canceled our foreclosure and disappeared for a year and a half. And I said to Mark, Mark, something just happened. That was power. What year was it? That was 2009. And that's when we started the work. And so then we got, we said, we got to get out of shame. We got to get through this process. And I started calling a couple of people I knew in the community that thought were in trouble. And we got together, four families got together and talked about this problem. And everybody had the same thing going on with them. That's power. See, we get past shame and we can talk. The forbidden territories to talk about are no longer forgiven. So we started moving through the process and we started doing simple things like sending off letters or getting some lame brain attorney to send off a letter. I'd have to go to the attorney. He goes, well, I don't know what to do about this. And I said, well, here's what I want you to do. And the attorney would call. Then he'd call me up and say, Mike, he liked it. It worked. And we started stopping foreclosures all over the state. I said that they're breaking our laws. Instead of asking for a free house or produce the note that does not apply in non-judicial process, we asked for little baby steps. We just kept hitting them in the head, hitting them in the head, sticking a little spear in the back. And we got, and then we would get a couple of more. They weren't, they weren't coming along with us and they weren't canceling. So we'd take them to court on the stuff. We would get a ruling. The first ruling was the McCoy ruling, big ruling we got. Thousands of foreclosures all over the state canceled in one week. That's power. What was the McCoy? The McCoy ruling, it had to do with our state laws. And I'm not going to go into, we don't have time to go into those today. If any of you are seriously interested in this work, what I want you to do is call me and all my contact information. We can talk about how you can start digging into your state laws to find ways to do these things. But my son went through that too, was that he stopped in Minnesota, but they, they get that phone call, I thought that kind of, the 
the grapevine got around nationally until many Well, days. there's different people across the country. We now, we now have people that have been in their homes up to six, six and a half years without making a payment. And the we, banks couldn't take the house from them because they couldn't prove that what the well, bill was. Here's what, here's what, and I'm not going to go into all our rulings, but we are getting probably a ruling a week now. And the banks are running scared, and that's power. Because we're out talking about forbidden topics in the courts. We have a four-legged stool we use. One of them is the legislature, and how do we work with our legislature? One of them is um, uh, our legal system, and trying to rein those guys in was easier than said than done. <laughs> but we've been very successful at it. Uh, and, how, and one of our goals was to stop non-judicial completely in our state within three years. And we did it in two years and 11 months. <laughs> Brought it to its knees. Now they have to go judicial, which all states can do. The problem with judicial is it's about $10,000 for the bank to file it, and if you object, it could be $150,000, $200,000 just stalling them. Uh -huh. So why does that give our homeowners power? They'll come forward and start negotiating. Our members, for the most part, are not asking for free houses. They want a sustainable solution. They want today's market value. They want today's interest rates. And they want the mess cleaned up. And we get it. And we do it, I can't get people there unless they take back their personal power by letting go of the house first. They have to go and let go. So we're now to the stage where we're in judicial foreclosure. We just got a big Supreme Court ruling. We took it all the way to the Supreme Court and spanked the banks. And it was fun. Um, federal Supreme Court? No, our state Supreme Court. Because real estate laws are state laws. So that's where they have to go. Um, so that was a lot of fun. The and ruling was what? I'm sorry. The ruling was that mortgage electronic registration systems has no power to either transfer a note or a deed and a note or to foreclose in their own name. So if MERS is on our deeds, they can't foreclose non-judicial. And if we can prove there's any unrecorded assignments, even if MERS isn't there, which we can quite often with the research team we have, they can't do it. So they've just given up. And they've gone to this very expensive route. And the legislation we worked three years on just went into effect on the 5th or the 4th of this month was that mediation. And they have to come to the table and show proof of that chain of title before they can start work on it. Now that's power. That's great. And we have thousands of families who could not afford an attorney. But for those few brave ones who did, we made the difference. And so the rest right on the wings. And, um, we just had our first trial jury where, um, jury trial, I always get that methods. Anyway, what happens is when you start taking these banks on, if you're going to jury trial, they don't want it. And what we always get, and the attorneys wouldn't believe me, and I told them, here's what's going to happen. You're going to get three days to one week out, and they're going to come crying on their knees and saying, what do you want? And the attorneys go, Anna, you don't understand. They're really beating me up on this one. I go, no, no, no. They're going to say, what do you want? Trust me. And we finally got to the point where we had two of them going right up against jury trial. And they did it. And he calls me up. This one attorney calls me up. And he goes, Nancy, they did it. I said, yeah, I know. They don't want to go to jury trial. The public is now educated what filth banks these guys are. And the conversation isn't quite so private. So we had some power there. One of the families that we got the, uh, the situation with decided they were going to settle. And I don't know what they got settled yet. Oh, I'll probably be finding out next month. But I think it was really big. What I do know is they're getting some damages. They're also getting that loan crammed down to today's market value and today's interest. But I don't know the details. Now that's a nice to end. They got their attorney fees paid. But that's an order. Or, OK. Then what? Um, the other one said, now this guy was so great, we don't make people go to trial, we, don't, we just lay out options. We do education, research, and referral, and empowerment. We don't tell people what they need to do. They have to decide. Is your group in Wisconsin, can people connect with you and start a similar group here in Wisconsin? Well, they can call us, and they, can, they need to create a Wisconsin style. Um, they can't do it the way we did because our laws are different. But there are things that can be done in every state. So then what, um, the other one who, it, it was like about a week apart, they came forward and said, what do you want? Now this guy was an immigrant. I just love him. His name is Bella. Bella is from Yugoslavia. 
Bella came to America. This is how Bella talks to me. He's always passionate. Bella calls me up. You know, I've been working with Bella three and a half years. They foreclosed on his house right in the middle of trial payments. Foreclosed on him, in the middle of making payments on time, as instructed. They told him to quit making the payment, and they started doing this trial payment, and they foreclosed on him. Three and a half years ago, we've kept him in the house the entire time. And they came to him and said, what do you want? And they offered him like, I don't know, $50,000 or something. And he says, no, I don't want $50,000. I want my dignity. So he gets it. This is not about a house. He wanted 52000 No. <laughs> he says, I have a daughter who was born here. I came here with my wife. We had a daughter here because we want the American dream. How do I face my daughter? She is pregnant. This is, he gives me this lecture. She is pregnant with my grandson, who's going to be born any day. How do I face them with no dignity? This is a dignity issue. This isn't about our houses. And this is how he saw his dignity playing out. The next family might not. I really don't care if they fight. I care about their dignity. And this is how Bella lived out his dignity. And he told them they could go fly a kite, he'd see them in court. And they showed up in court, and it was the most conservative county with the worst rulings we had gotten in the state. It's like, oh my god, we're in Washington County with this thing. And they had these jurors who came in who were appalled at what happened to them. And they turned on Chase. Yes, that was the power. And Here's what he got right on the, on the ruling right there. He got $10,000 that day, but his damages ruling is coming up in September, and the minimum will be $220,000. And he has to decide if he wants to keep the house or not, and we'll deal with that. So it's a process still ongoing. But is that a great day? Yes. Now, here's what it really did. What message did it send to every Wall Street bank about screwing people in Oregon? Don't go to court. Don't go to court. You better get to the table early, and you better start playing nice. Now, this is called Taming the Beast. And this has been our agenda, and we've been really successful at it. And one of the surveys we did early on was to um, try and understand who our people were, who our members were. We did no advertising. I can tell you, advertising does not work to bring these people in. Why, why do they not respond to an ad if you put an ad in the paper that says, Help for foreclosure. They are embarrassed. Embarrassed. Okay. They're used to being scammed. Mm -hmm. The scams are abundant. You know how many They've of us already have been scammed? <laughs> we have one family that came to us, $12,000 was all they had to do, and they went and borrowed the money from her Korean mother. $12,000. And this, this company was going to fix the problem. Do you think their phones worked after they got the 12 grand? No. There was no fix. The money is gone. So fear, shame. Shame is right up in here. I mean, it's just shame is just embedded in this mess. There is so much shame. When I first started doing recovery on my childhood, I was so ashamed. After all, wasn't it my fault that Daddy had to beat me? He told me so every day. After all, wasn't it my fault that my brother died? He died of cancer. How could that be my fault? You know, but this is the shame in the Amer under the American umbrella. So um, we wanted to know who they were, because we weren't advertising. The people we got were just people who showed up. It was all word of mouth. And they showed up a mess. They showed up broken. And we realized that 80% of the people coming our way were small and micro business owners. Interesting. And were these people deadbeats? They had been the backbone of our communities. The average micro-business owner in America employs three families. And when they lost their business, those families lost their work. And a lot of those people couldn't collect unemployment. So they weren't even counted on the rolls. In Southern Oregon, we estimated, even though they said our unemployment at the height was at 12 percent, that we were really at 30 percent. Unemployment under so we started looking at, going back to where I had started our work, was how do we start strengthening our local economies, these local micro-businesses that employ people, that actually might have some dignity in their work and care about their employees because there's a sense of family and community in it. And that's our, our next phase, our fourth leg, is, is building and strengthening those um, micro-businesses. Those micro 
I'd just like to say an end of my run. Uh, when I was a young child, I was picked up by a bishop, a Catholic bishop in Duluth. If I hadn't behaved myself at the pond lake that he brought me to, and just went along, my bones would be pushing up water a little bit. Now, my mom and dad were humane. They had the humane genes. I was fortunate. I feel sorry for you, but you have survived. Okay. There was nothing ladies. to feel sorry. You're an amazing lady. Thank you. But there's nothing to feel sorry for. I'll tell you what, I couldn't do this work today if I hadn't been through that. What I went through. And you know what? All of us come to the table walking wounded. We all have scars. And I'm going to ask you to heal from the scars so you can help other people heal. This is about healing America and healing the planet. This work is. Nancy, I've been doing this for a year, and you know, I this was the best workshop I have seen. You know, I mean, really the humanity at the max, and trying, you know, like what you're saying. Maybe you're talking about foreclosure, but it applies to every um, projects that we are working. We can treat it that way. You know, I mean, we, I may not be in um, foreclosure, but I'm going to definitely use the personal story, my wounds, and connect, connect it to how we can strategically come in with a plan and move forward. Okay, thank you. All right, we've got a couple minutes left. I'm going to talk about the heart of the beast, the bull that we're working with. And I'm going to talk about what they're doing with our money. And I have every one of you, and I'm going to walk out of here with, you know, feelings um, like this, but also plan for your money and a plan for how you're going to spread it to other people. One of our missions early on was Move Your Money. How many of you have worked with Move Your Money campaigns? Okay. They're essential. We've just scratched the surface. We need to keep doing it. And I'm going to say something about everybody thinks the credit unions are the darlings. No. They're just don't beat us as bad. They got their problems and their money every single night when they shut down, their, their money all goes to Wall Street for the nighttime. Good comment. And it's, uh, I'll tell you that there's, there's problems there. But let's talk about, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a math formula here so you can understand what they do with every bit of debt in every loan in America. Even if you've got a parking ticket, it may have been sold and securitized. Oh my God. And what? it could be on a casino on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. The debt, debt is just, it's, there's a whole debt machine. And remember this, I, I mentioned Don McCoy was our first big win, and we do a whole, we have a research team that digs into these loans, and we go deep into the bowels of Wall Street, into the Edgar database, the SEC files, we dig out data, we find facts and trails of who the players are, who the players aren't, where the lies are, and I'm telling you the lies are deep. And Don McCoy had a $320,000 loan. And when he took out that loan, he was told he was going to get like a 5% or no, a 6% fixed loan. So he thought, well, I thought I can afford that, right? He shows up at the closing table and he has in writing it's a 6% fixed on his good faith estimate. And when the notes and deed and stuff were put in front of him, it was 8 and 3 quarters that would go to 15 and 3 quarters. <laughs> Do you know how many Americans got that? You got, you got the bait and switch? You got at one of those? The, at the closing. Yeah. At the closing. At the closing. And let me tell you who they did it most to. They did it to the most vulnerable people in America. They did it to anybody they could. Don's just a white guy. They did it to him. But the blacks, the Latinos, the Asians, the fellas, it was guaranteed. They reverse red line and went into those communities and did this formula. And I'm going to show you why, because the formula is so, so profitable. Where did they get the money? We used to get loans, real estate loans, on Main Street from a local bank. And without having a two hour time to explain how that shifted, I won't. But now all the loans come from Wall Street. And they come from a big bag of money. Where do you think that big bag of money comes from? Federal Reserve. <laughs> so was thin air, but what? From the Fed? Fed. Okay. They come from our pension plans. Oh, oh my God. God. Okay, so they went after the unions all over the world, not just America. Pension plans were loaded with money. And Wall Street's greed kicked in and said, oh my gosh, we've got to get into that dish of candy. 
And typically, if a pension plan was getting a 2% yield, it was pretty good. What started happening? People started living longer. These pension fund managers were responsible to pay out to all the pensioners. What happens if they live an extra four or five years? The math doesn't work. So the pension folks were all getting together saying, how do we get higher yield? And at the same time, these Wall Street players were saying, how do we siphon out of those pools of money? And it was a marriage made in hell. And they sold it as a good thing. And here's what happened. They went to the pension, and, and here's, here's where you, this is us, getting a loan, and there's all these parties until we get up to this, you know, big bag of money. So these intermediaries right through here wanted to go get the money. And so what they would do is go down and give us a loan. Now, they went to Wall Street and they said, we can give you 5% yield. What do you think that did to those pension funders? They were hot dog. And they go, well, how safe is it? We can't do risky stuff. And they said, you're not even going to believe how safe. Stuff is. This stuff is gold. It is triple A rated. This is like, this is your lucky day. And this is the sale they made. And they had all these guys on Wall Street that rated the different investments. And what were they, anybody know what they were called? Rating agencies. Rating agencies, thank you. And who were some of them? Standard and Poor? Moody's. Moody's. Okay, so we know who these players are. There's about four or five of them. How is Libor getting this? Libor is another thing. Story. Okay. okay, so you've got this, you've got these rating agencies, and these things were called mortgage-backed securities. Pension plans did not buy our loans, contrary to belief. I talk to people all the time, they go, my loan was sold and sold and sold, and I go, no, that isn't what happened at all. Your money came from here, and it shot right down to fund it right there. It was never resold. What changes is the servicer, and you think your loan is being sold. So one of the things we do in our office is to go find out who is the chain, who are all these players, and where did the money come from, and how much was actually taken out. So you've got this 5% yield, and you've got these rating agencies. They have no idea how to rate this stuff. So they started making it up. And when I first started talking about this, people like me out of Migo started going on. Well, it's now all common knowledge. They admit they made it up. And what if Standard & Poor's said, no, I don't know if I can rate that AAA. They'd run over to another house where they get AAA. So they were competing. Now this is a place where unbridled greed and competition are not good for America. And so 5% interest. So what these guys would do is they would go get these engineered loans. These, and they would take and tell the bag of money, we got this thing at 15 and 3 quarters, even though it isn't today. And because of the way the conversion rates go, and I'm not going to do all the math here today, when they converted from, because these guys didn't buy the notes, they funded, they bought the cash flow on the notes. That's what these bonds were. So what they did was, the, these intermediaries would go to the bag of money, and for Don's loan, they took out close to $1 million to fund a $320,000 loan. What's wrong with that? <laughs> it's a lot of money. Okay, so they put, paid out the 320 and they put about 680 in their pocket. Was that a good day? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and when they were doing thousands and thousands and thousands of them every month, was Wall Street having the time of their life? This is unbridled greed beyond what most people can. When I first started digging into this and getting and looking at these numbers, and I'm real strong in math, I kept saying they couldn't have. It's got to be illegal. It's got to be immoral. But the way, the way they structured their laws is they could do it. And they took about 80,000 of it, and they'd run down the street to something called Lehman Brothers, <laughs> which was kind of an insurance company, AIG Insurance. Remember those, those egg commercials where you watch AIG and their egg commercials? Yeah, what a cute company. Anyway, <laughs> those guys, they go buy something. Hang on, just they buy something that looked like insurance, but it wasn't because there was nothing backing it and it wasn't regulated. And they would insure the fact that if this loan went down, that it would get paid. Now here's the problem. Because of unbridled greed, they had a couple things going on. This was so much fun and so profitable 
that the same loan was often being sold to several banks of money at the same time. So you've got double, triple Ponzi's going on in the same little $320,000 loan on some working stiff on Main Street in Southern Oregon. And he had no idea. And then they would take the $80,000 and buy bets, and they wouldn't buy one bet. And I call them bets because they really weren't insurance. What would happen if you bought a fire insurance policy in your house and you went back into the agent and said, I'd like 30, please? What would the agent say? Why do you need 30 policies on burning your house down? What does he think you're going to go do? Burn your, Burn your house down. That's exactly what they did. So all these different players, and these were insiders, they knew which houses were going to burn down. They knew where the fires were. And they bet heavily, and it cost them pennies to buy it. And they went to groups like Lehman and um, AIG. There were a few others. Goldman Sachs had some of them. And they, they'd take a little bit of that money, and they would just bet on this poor slob. Now, what happens when they knew he was going to get in trouble as soon as that loan started ratcheting up, right? And they knew when it was going to be. So what, then what they would do is they just wait. And a lot of times, I'll tell you, in the Latino and black communities, we saw these ratchets happen sometimes in month three, not two years down the road. These loans were geared, you know, hey, you're not even going to believe it. You had an $800 a month house payment on the big mansion. The mariachi player and all his family thought, hot dog, we've got a lot of bedrooms, the whole family moves in, you know, the, 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 the casa is beautiful. And so, but month three, all of a sudden, it was a $3,000 house payment. They didn't know what hit them. Number one, they couldn't even read the paperwork, not because they were stupid, but it wasn't in their language. And so this was, you know, they knew when these things were going down, this was engineered. So then what happened? was when the bets started coming in. So if you only had one, let's say that the, with Don's they only had one. You got a million dollar Ponzi on the front end because they know Don's not going to make the payments, so they'll take some of the 600 and make the payments for a while while they're working on foreclosing you. That's a Ponzi. But when this stuff, when the, uh, if they can get him foreclosed, the cash could be as much as $10 million on his house alone. That's what broke Wall Street in 08. Wait, question. Uh, John Cassidy uh, wrote a book called uh, All Markets Fail, and he tells this story in that book. It's okay. really interesting read. Yeah, there's a bunch of them out. This is, you know, we first started coming up with this from our research. People thought we were nuts. Now, I tell them we all know I'm nuts, but I'm not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. So, uh, so what, what they were making, they made a fortune going up, they made a quadruple fortune coming down. So when Don calls in and says, hey, can you help me? Can you, you know, get this thing that's ratcheting out of control back to normal? You promised me. In fact, when he objected to this loan at the closing table, they said, don't worry, we'll fix it when it starts to go Yes, back. that's what they always say. That's what they always say, and they couldn't. So what these guys were really excited about, the, these intermediaries, is that when Don called in and said, can you help me, what did they tell him? You have to be 90 days late. Right. Why? Because some of the credit default swaps were written to cash in at that point. The casino starts cashing if we can get people to quit making the payments. And this is why the banks, and recently, I don't know if any of you saw in the newspaper that um, there were seven whistleblowers, and I think it was a case in New York, I'm not sure. Several whistleblowers that were pulled into this case. They were from all over. Did you see the case? Bank America, where Bank they were America. given the $500 bonuses and the gift cards. Gift cards. And there more of our foreclosures among them. Yeah, and these people were like minimum wage people, so it's like they're desperate, right? So you got a debt slave sitting there on minimum wage, and the only way to get a bonus is if you deny people modifications who qualify and they have quotas every single week. They didn't meet their quotas, they got fired. If they didn't meet their quotas, they got to keep the job. And if they went beyond their quotas, yes, you too can get a gift card to bed, bath, and beyond. <laughs> and we were saying this was going on, and what did they say to us? You're nuts. That's a conspiracy. I said, no, it's not a conspiracy. This is a business model, and they're doing it right out in the open because denial and codependence is so deep in America, and this is such forbidden territory to open our eyes and look at. They can get away with it blatantly. 
Just a quick antidote of how deep this really goes. My wife, one of her first jobs out of college is working at Anchor Bank, which ironically is on Main Street, right up <laughs> on the square. And she was in the marketing department. They had meetings where they would go around the table and strategize how they could get people to overdraft on their account to get that $15 fee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> on both housing payments, credit cards, all kinds of debt, they will also hold that stuff till past the um, grace period. And we've got lots of families who paid on time and were in default and foreclosure and never missed a payment that was because of that grace period issue when the junk fees start coming in. And here's one of the things that these, you know, you call the servicer, like we have Chase is our servicer. They don't own our loan. We found where our loan, where our money came from. And it's in a trust. But they make more money. It's been proven that they make 46% more just on servicing issues off of foreclosure than on servicing a loan. I mean, that is just vulgar. And that's before you even start getting into the casino stuff. Okay. Can we um, start passing a law to stop servicing a loan and just have real lenders? Would that be We something? used to have that. And, you know, that's a two-hour dis discussion to get to. And yes. I don't know about passing a law. But what if we refuse to take these loans? What if we refuse to participate? But most people don't know I have to get one. Here's what Mark and I did. We crashed and burned. They wouldn't take our money. There's no place to make a payment. By the way, those trial payments do not go towards your loan. They all go to junk fees. And so you're making, they tell you three months, we have people two years still making trial payments, waiting for their mod, and then they would get the Wheel of Misfortune spun, and then they're off to foreclosure. After they had bled them for two years of payments that didn't go toward them. The most cruel president we've ever had, believe it or not, and I'm a Democrat, Bill Clinton. Because in 1999, okay, I, I gotta, I'm he allowed stop the stop removal here. of the Glass-Steagall Act, and that's what okay. allowed all of this to happen. Okay, Will, I'm going to stop you, and I'll tell you why. At all our meetings, we don't allow, and this is not our meeting, but I'm the, the leader, we don't deny, we don't allow political banter on this stuff. Yes, and he ruse the day he did it. Uh, he that. still comes here and brags about how nice a guy he is. Uh, so how does this also affect credit cards? What's it, are they doing the same formula to credit cards? Yes. Yes, and they're doing it with student loans. They're doing it with student loans. Yeah. They do it with car loans. You get your car loan from the credit union, you ask them if they keep that loan. And if they don't, you go elsewhere to get the loan. If they're selling your, their loans to the secondary market, you go find someplace else to get a loan. Keep that money on Main Street. And here's why I tell people to move their money. You have $100. I have people say, oh, I don't have much money. I'm broke. I only have $100 in Wells Fargo. And I go, well, what do you think they do with that $100? That's your money. The first thing they do before your, the door is even hitting you on the backside out the door, they have loaned that money out. Let's say we're going to go, uh, what's your name, Michael? Let's say, Michael. Michael wanted to restart his credit. Just went through a real bad time in life. And he wants to restart his credit. They say, hey, Michael, we'll help you. We're Wells Fargo. I, I, I can tell Wells Fargo stories all day long. <laughs> My favorite one, though, is the fact that they sued themselves and won. I love that. <laughs> so anyway, um, Let's say you went into Wells, somebody else, what's your name again? Oh, no, oh, not Marie. 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 Marie had deposited or left a hundred bucks in there, thinking it doesn't matter, it's not that much. They're going to tell you, okay, Michael, we'll loan you a thousand dollars on a credit card. We'll give you a thousand dollar line of credit on a credit card. You get your credit. You better be a good boy and you better pay it back on time. Or else it'll go to that 29% interest. So, you're thinking, okay, I'm going to get my start. Before nightfall even hits, they have securitized that debt. And they take the 29% that they're hoping you're going to get to. And they do that ratio. And they may have sold that debt or, or pulled money out of uh, somebody's pension fund, you know, to the tune of, you know, you may think you're only paying 10% or something, but they might have sold that thing to the tune of about, you know, $10,000. They pulled out. And the Ponzi and the game starts over. And they have no power if you don't give them your money. So, because I've, I've always tried to wrap my brain around credit cards. Obviously, I probably use them every day. But 
I don't, you know, I never carry a balance and all that stuff, mm -hmm. but it's still, you're saying, absolutely. feeds the system, just carrying Abs a, a line of credit. Absolutely. Feeds the system. Feeds the system. And there's problems with debit cards, and a lot of times you can't do the ideal thing. We're in a transition. We have gone to just using debit cards. And I can tell you, since the bank quit taking our house payments, we couldn't make the full payment, we could make some, we put it away every single month. Do you where? know four and a half years? I, I'm not going to say where I put it because it's not in a bank. It's in a pillow. Yeah. Do you know, in that little black box. Do you know what four and a half years of putting a big chunk of money away does? Add up. And so here's what we're training our people. So you take that money. And it's a massive down payment. Who cares about your credit? You go buy something cash or mostly cash, and you pay it off in five years. And you know if you can get your you know past one year past the worst nightmare, local banks will start working with you if you've got a big enough chunk of cash. We're looking at how do you create loans and buy houses in five years. And it's very doable if people have a strategic plan. This Wall Street thing is just this debt slave. And you're empowering them to take out a war. You're empowering them to do all the things you hate most when you have your money with the man who beats you. And instead of fighting him, just quit playing with him. Quit giving him your life. And we have thousands of families who are doing this. Go ahead. I have to go, but I want to make you smile. <laughs> the page before, the one that you just erased, when yes. AIG pays the, the holder of the loan, right. what happens to that loan if it's already paid off? That's a good question. Smile, but, come on. But smile. here's here's what here's what, we've we've tried to address that. Mm -hmm. The judges won't touch it. Yeah, they won't. Well, we haven't got them in Oregon to that stage. We take it in baby steps. And um, that MERS ruling was huge. It was huge, and the, the other ruling we got was huge. So <clears throat> what I want to leave you with is I want to leave you with I think we're about out of time too. Yeah, we're past uh, time actually. Okay, I'm going to leave you with one final story is that you are the ones, you're the ones that make the difference. You're the ones that lead those that are broken and lost in PTSD. You're the ones because you're here. And you may rue the day you came to my workshop. <laughs> <laughs> but, but one of the things, that, a little story I like to end up with is a cute little story. It's about two little sisters who, one of them was a total optimist and one of them was a total pessimist. And the parents wanted to take and balance these girls out. So at Christmas time, they took the one who was always negative, nothing was ever enough. And they got her everything she could dream of, and they had it under the Christmas tree. And when she, the two girls came down for Christmas, she opened up all these presents. It took hours. She threw paper everywhere, and then she said, it's not enough. And the other little girl, when it was all done, went looking for her gifts. And there was one paper bag to the Christmas tree for her. And it was full of a bag of horse poo poo. And she got so excited. And she horse started poo -poo. running around the tree. And the parents looked at her and said, what is going on with her? And she said, with all this horse poo poo here, there's got to be a pony for me. <laughs> so I want to send you off into the world catching ponies you can ride to take to where you want to go. But you've got to have a plan. You've got to have a vision. You've got to get out of denial. And you've got to be compassionate with people as you take them through that process. And I hope, as you're out there catching ponies, that I hear from somebody. If any of you want to be on our mailing list, just um, send these around.